Namaste everyone. I welcome you all to today's Yes Talk. The title today is Adolescence, the Best of Times and the Worst of Times. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Ratna Sata. I'll give a brief introduction for her. Dr. Ratna Sata is a professor of psychology at the City College of New York and director of the Laboratory for Neuropsychopharmacology. She received her PhD from Ames, New Delhi. She has worked as a professor and neuroscientist in New York for over 30 years. Recently, she was awarded the Kamla BK Anand Oration Award by Ames. Welcome, Ratna ma'am. Thank you so much for being with us today. Looking forward to an interesting session with you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Arunima, for that beautiful introduction. I've been waiting for this opportunity for a long time since Dr. Bijlani first approached me and we had talked about me participating in your uh, seminar series. So good morning, everybody from New York. I know it's evening, 6 p.m. in Delhi. It's very cold. As you see, I'm still wearing my thick jacket actually at home even because we've turned the central heating off, but it's very cold. And it's raining outside, but at least it's nice and warm here. And I'm looking forward to a very nice interaction. So what I've done is I'm going to present some slides. I have at least 70 slides on this presentation, which I, but don't worry, I'm not going to present all of them. I'm going to I've just pick some so that we can have time for discussions. Because this is going to be something I'm looking for is a discussion point. So let me, this will be just a baseline from which we can start discussing this. Um, let me go to the, so this is what New York and some of the institutions that are working as Columbia University when I started my postdoc, Albert Einstein, Einstein and City College of New York and the institution has still have been associated with while. So I'm going to start with a, a, a poetry or actually a, a, a Shakespeare play that I had read in seventh grade. I didn't know then that I was going to use this as the introduction to my talk today, but it's very relevant. Uh, it talks about the seven ages of man. And it, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the seven ages, the infant mewling and puking, throwing up. So that's the baby. Then there's the school boy, who's carrying a satchel on his back, unwilling to go to school, literally forcing himself to be taken there. And that's the child. Then comes a lover, which will equate to a teenager, followed by the soldier who's the adult. Then he becomes more mature. He becomes a justice or a judge, I guess, an older adult. Then you have an older man, which would be equivalent to the elderly population today. And then you have a Deep old age, which is like a second childhood, senior elder. Too many stages, but so we, we're going to make it a little more simpler. If you look at our Hindu scriptures, there are four stages of life. They do not include infancy or childhood, because I guess they're still dependent upon the parents for care, etc. But you have the Brahmacharya, and the, that is what I'm going to equate to adolescence. For, and that's when you're supposed to be staying at the Gurukul, reading, getting your scriptures or books or education, et cetera. Then you move into the stage. When you marry, you have your family, you have a job, you have your, you move out the ranks, you bring up your children. Then comes the, uh, the, the Van Prasthas stage. Once, according to the, um, our scriptures, once you've seen the face of your grandchild, it's time to go to Van Prasthas. Not physically, you don't have to leave everything to go to the forest, but you become more developed, Vivek and Vairagya. Okay? And then finally, and you become a sannyas. In the real sense, means you really become a monk, or you can be a, as a monk in the worldly life too. So the I, I mean, this is going to be a whole spiritual talk. I'm, I'm into spiritual, let me make a disclosure. I am, I have been initiated in the Ramakrishna Mission Mark. So I am a devotee of the, but so we can have a whole discussion on Vedanta and the, the I changes. Uh, the I, the small I, that me, 
that was a baby once upon a time, became a teenage a, a child, a teenager, an adult uh, towards the elderly phase of my life. So that I changes. But if you see inside, that I didn't change. I still feel I'm like a little girl that I was when I was a child. So there are two eyes. There's the child eye that changes with time, which is actually the body, your mind, the intelligence things. But then there's a big eye at the back, which is the Atman, which does not change. We not this is not a spiritual lecture for today. We can have a discussion of this later on. But what I'm trying to say is along life's journey, the eye changes, the body changes, the mind changes, the intelligence changes. And today we can focus on the this one, the, the, the one in the middle, the adolescent. So adolescence, if you go back, I'm quoting from Socrates, the, the Greek philosopher from 450 BCE. And he was the father of Western uh, philosophy and uh, democracy, etc. So what he did is about the adolescents, they contradict parents and they tyrannize their teachers. Does that seem familiar? I think all of us are not ahead and think we can agree with them. So some things haven't changed over time. Over thousands of years. So that's kind of interesting. And even if you look at the across species, adolescence is there in every species. Most species. I wouldn't say every species, but I don't know if there is an adolescence in Earth or something. But in most species, they are maintained, the concern. So we have birds when the chicks grow up, and then they, actually the parents will push them out of the nest and they will fly away. The tigers. They, 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 for the for cubs now they'll grown up. They will be more, they'll be moving away to some own uh, family or group. And same thing with primates and other species. So is that the, this adolescence is present across species. And the timing in humans in humans is about the second decade of life. Usually, teen years means thirteen to nineteen, but it's a little bit more global than that. So it's the second decade of life that we consider as the, uh, the adolescent people. And there are soft signs that the body changes. I will look at a few of the features uh, eventually. Puberty kicks in when all the hormones are going haywire. And now the learning that a teenager is learning to navigate complex social skills. So remember, they're mixing with friends, their peer pressures, they are, and especially now the society has changed so much that the peers have a lot of influence on the individual than when, say, we were growing up, when parents had more influence on us, even as teenagers, than, uh, than today's population. They're learning self control. They know now they have uh, faced negative consequences. If they did something wrong, there is a consequence to that. They can't get away with it. Then they have in, inadequate decision making. And the last three are put together because I want to emphasize, and this is what I've been working on, my research has been to understand the teen brain from an animal perspective, because a lot of experiments you cannot do in humans. So we will be looking at the molecular, biochemical, genetic changes during brain development. So what we to summarize all that finding, we can say that the brain is still developing during Allison. And the development takes place from the, I'm not sure can my um, uh, arrow that I'm moving around on the bottom, can the pointer? Uh, Aruni, no. can you unmute and tell me if you can see my, my uh, pointer? No. No. Okay. But so I just want to see that the little arrow at the bottom, it goes from back to front. That indicates the brain is finishing development from the part of the brain to the front of the brain. This is looking at the brain from the side. So the front portion is orange. The back portion is the yellow thing at the back. I'm not going to give you a lecture on neuroscience, so don't worry. But I want you to focus on what I've written there, the prefrontal cortex. That is the foremost tip of the brain. And this is what in human makes us human. This is the biggest portion of our brain compared to all the other primate species and other species. And this is the last part of the brain to mature. And why is that important? Because all our high nervous functions are located here. 
So if the brain is not, that part of the brain is not developed, that is control our decision-making, our, uh, you know, control, control behavior needs to be controlled, et cetera, then how, what can we do? The, it's not that we are at fault, it's our brain is not developed enough. It's still maturing. So I just want you to keep that in mind. The brain region that is responsible for higher nervous functions, including decision making, including reward seeking, including novelty seeking, has still not fully matured and developed. So this this is something I'd like to keep you for you to keep in mind. And this is very interesting, and I wanted to focus in on it. That teens, India has the largest adolescent population in the world. We have the largest population in the world overall. And uh, among them, the largest adolescent population in the world is in India. There are 250 million teens. That means every fifth one is between the age of 10 and 19. This is a great asset, the great asset, because in most countries, the, 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 the uh, young people, the population is going down and the elderly population is going up. And what does it have mean that you have more older people they have to be supported by social, uh, you, know, you see the unrest in France. Just by raising the retirement age by one or two years, there's a whole chaos in the country because they have to be supported by the government. They get so many people into social security, they get some payment like a pension plan. So who's going to put money into the pension plan so that they get a pension? If less people are coming into the workforce, they, so the taxes are not there, be collected to, to go towards the pension. So we have bigger population that are retiring, few people coming into the workforce, and this is a problem in many, many, including China, including China, where the elderly population is going up, and because of the one-child policy till recently, their young people population has been going down. And India has been wonderful. India has this one great asset for young people, that are going to be a workforce and to take India to, to brilliant heights. So I'm quoting here at the bottom from UNICEF India that says, India stands to benefit socially, politically, and economically if this large number of adolescents are kept safe, healthy, educated, and equipped with information and life skills to support the country's continued development. So it is up to adults to create an environment for these young people to mature into healthy individuals and contribute to our society. So I thought that was something we need to be very proud of and be very hopeful for our future country. So as the title of my talk says, that this is the analysis is the best of times and it's also the worst of times. So let's get to the best of times. So why do I say it's the best of times? Because we are in the most healthy phase of our lives that will ever be. We've gotten over our childhood illnesses. We have, you know, with your the child, your ear infection is a big thing. Then who we up is to be big. All the childhood illnesses are over. And you are in the prime of your life in terms of physical capabilities. So, and, uh, and what, 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 all the developmental bodily developments have been complete. And they include the reproductive system, so they've gone through puberty. Then the immune functions has been developing. It's one, of, and I'll show you what goes on in the immune functions. The muscular skeleton, the motor functions, also have finished developing, and so has the brain. So by the, I'm thinking at the end of adolescence, but during adolescence we are going on. The processes go, those processes are going on, but the culmination is at the end of adolescence. I don't, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. This is something very obvious, and everybody in this audience uh, has probably is aware of it. I'm just repeating it to the choir. But what we know is during adolescence, the external body changes, the secondary sexual changes are taking place in, in boys. You see the hair developing, uh, the testing, testicular defense taking place, the Adam's apple, the voice changes in women. Menstruation begins, uh, the breast development, the body, the female body, the curvy, curvy body that can have all the, the all that happens during adolescence because the hormones are kicking, the pubertal hormones have started kicking in. 
And so we have these bodily changes going on that uh, are finished. Pam, the admissions uh, is over. These changes are complete. I want to make a, put a disclaimer here. I'm only talking about the binary genders, men, elf, male, and female. But there are other uh, LGBTQ community, uh, community that I'm not addressing. And I don't think that's the focus of today's talk. If you want to have a discussion, you can have a discussion separately. But this is limiting to the binary gender. So males and females with distinct hormonal uh, genetic uh, brain makeup. Because the brain is different, male and females. I won't go into that. But the, there are differences in sexual dimorphism in the brain that makes a man's brain different from a woman's brain. Adolescent. That is a, when the peak immune function takes place. And uh, I'm going to give you an example. So the, 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 actually, the, I was quoting from somebody's work says, during the rest of our life, we're in senescence. That means old age, quote unquote old age. So the, the peak of the immune system is during the teen years, and after that, it goes into senescence. And this graph on the bottom kind of displays what I'm trying to say. So here is during the pandemic, people were given shots. You know, we all got antibodies. We got all on booster shots. So after the second one, the top bar, the dark blue bar, is the response in a young person, in a teen. And you see the peak is much higher and stays longer. It declines, of course, but it doesn't decline to below where it is beneficial for uh, preventing infection. And then when you give a booster dose, it goes up very fast, much higher than the first one. And then it starts to drop. We don't know why because it hasn't been followed up yet. If you look at the low bar, which is the pale blue bar, it also peaks, but the peak height is much lower than that you see in teens and younger people. And it comes down to much lower levels, even below where the antibody level generated are below what would give you protection. And that doesn't happen in teens. The teens go down, but it doesn't go down to the level. If you uh, see the second broken uh, dash line from the bottom, that's the level that you need to have protection. Oh, but the, 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 the for maximum protection. But uh, the, in adults, it goes way below the third the bottom line. Peak. And uh, the, if the booster it doesn't go up, it goes almost as high as what you see in the systems, and then it starts to become. So this is because our immune system is not as responsive uh, uh, in adults as it is in teenager and younger people. What about muscle, muscular performance? This is when you can have the most uh, peak performance. And I show you on the right a picture of, I'm sure some of us that are old enough to have been around with Nadia community who got her Olympic goals she was 15 years old when she did a, she got a 10, uh, 10 out of 10 for her performance. And you can see on the right, she's balancing her entire body pretty much on one toe. The other leg is way far in the back. Both her arms are spread out outwards and she's able to balance herself. And she performed standing there. She went to cartwheels and whatnot. I mean, we can just look at her. Today, she's also in her, um, she's a mature adult. You know? If she went back and tried to do it, do you think she can do it? Absolutely not. Because her performance has gone down. So I have marked out in red the phase with you have peak muscle and motor function and coordination. You need not only muscle function, but you also need coordination. So hand movement, everything has to be coordinated. That hand motor uh, sensitive coordination peaks in the teenage years. And after that, it declines. What about cognitive functioning? And here I show you uh, data showing that the cognitive function also during adolescence, particularly what we call the fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence means the processing of uh, information, working memory, you know, you can give up a set of words, change the order of words, and try to figure out what the order was before. All the fluid inter intelligence markers peak during adolescence, and then they go rapid decline over time. The only, only function that 
actually get better in age. So all of us that are elderly shouldn't get disheartened because something good does happen with aging. And that is called specialized intelligence. That is low in uh, teenage years. And that makes sense. What is uh, uh, crystallized intelligence includes uh, vo basically vocabulary. So this, they have not read as many books as the elders have, elders have, or mature elders have. So obviously their vocabulary is going to be much more uh, complex than you see an adult who has read a lot of books lifelong. And that's one thing you can do even in aging, in healthy age, we had a lecture, yes, lecture on healthy aging. And you know, people read books, scriptures, they read scriptures and they memorize scriptures and all that stuff. That function uh, it, it changes in a direction. But the other uh, processing of speed, working memory, all that shows a decline. And I'll, show, I'll continue with the next slide, also the same story. And you can see that, that uh, memory peaks, as I said, uh, in the teenage years, on the left, I marked it in, in, uh, in the ring circle. And in the top, you see seven day. Now, the test was people are given seven digit telephone numbers or 10 digit telephone numbers to memorize. Okay. And they were asked to dial the numbers as soon as they had finished, they were told the numbers. And uh, the top one is the after uh, seven digits, when they were asked to recall immediately. You see the highest is on the left again during adolescence, and then it goes. And then if you have a 10 digit, the memory is less, the orange line. Now, if you have the seven digits, but when you dial, you get a busy signal at the end, at the other end, and you have to redial the same number again. And you see the blue line is much shallower than the top crimson line. So with the more difficulty, the tests uh, get harder and you perform less well. And the green line is again, now it's a 10 digit memory recall with a business signal after the first time. And on all of them, you see on the left side, 18 year olds uh, is when uh, 35, that range is when you get best performance. And it, 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 it starts to go downhill after that. Let me touch on one more thing. Look at life uh, patterns across ages. So when we are born, a newborn, out of the 20 hours, sleeps for 16 hours. And the few hours that are awake is usually for feeding, changing of diapers, being done, uh, carried around, etc. And out of the 16 hours, eight are spent in dreaming, we call REM sleep. And the other eight hours in non REM sleep or deep sleep. And as we go, get older, grow older, the total duration of sleep gets reduced. And then also the REM sleep, the dream state of sleep, also gets reduced significantly. And if you look at the, the, the red square rectangle that I have outlined, that is during adolescence. At the beginning, a 10 year old, they, they sleep about 10 hours. And by the time Alice is over like 20 years, that has gone down to about eight hours. This is very important. And I want to, the reason I'm happy is because most teenagers don't get enough sleep. At least here in the United States, they are being recommended that a teenager should get nine hours of sleep, which they don't. Because they are they're going to bed late, they are on the social media, and then when they fall asleep, they cannot get up at seven in the morning to go to school by eight. So in many places are reconsidering this thing and saying, why don't we start too late for teenagers? Rather than having to start at eight o'clock, maybe we should start at nine o'clock. So they have an extra one hour sleep. So minimum duration of sleep for teenagers is nine hours. If you don't sleep nine hours, we'll see some of the consequences of that. It's very, very important. Not just a healthy diet and exercise, but sleep is also very important, especially quality of sleep. We tell them don't have your cell phone on because the blue light is going to be bothering you. You know, every time it pings, don't look at it and try to respond to it. So those are things that we can look at. It's very, very important that teenagers get sufficient sleep, good quality sleep. So those good things, right? So now let's look at some of the worst of times. Why do I say that this is also the worst of times? There are two, two, two things. 
One, it's during adolescence that mental illnesses make their appearance. And especially, I'm going to mention two of them because my work has been on this for a long time. Schizophrenia or psychosis and depression. You don't have a schizophrenic infant or a child. You don't have a depressed uh, uh, toddler. They make their first appearance in, in during, uh, during adolescence. And the second thing is getting into risky behavior. That puts them in harm's way. And this is because they can make a decision because the brains are still maturing. As I said the prefrontal cortex is the one that's going to put break on bad behavior. That break mechanism has not been put in place. So they will, they will engage many times in risky behaviors. So these are the two things. One is mental for which they're not directly responsible. It's genetic. A lot of there's a genetic component, which is a genes that you that make you more susceptible to developing schizophrenia or depression. Then there is the environment. There was a lot of uh, discussions and which is not for that if you don't have proper material environment, which is not true. But there's a lot of interaction between nutrition and childhood and growing up, etc. So this is pretty much out of the hands of the teenager per se. But the second one, the teenager can be complete, can be responsible for. So I'm going to do just quote from six few hours. I was, you know, I keep working on my lectures. The last minute I'm giving now, just before I was talking, I was typing in my 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 things of cake, and this I just read. Why are in crisis? There is a crisis. There's a huge crisis, especially with the pandemic. The teen crisis has become extremely bad. And I'm going to read this. We're in the midst of a serious teen mental health crisis. The number of teenagers and young adults with clinical depression more than doubled between 2011 and 2021. The suicide rate for teenagers nearly doubled from 2007 to 2019 and tripled for 10 to 14 year olds in particular. According to the CDC, which is the Center for Drug, um, um, drug Compliance, um, nearly 25% of teenage girls made a suicide plan in 2021. So what's going on? So this whole thing was, this uh, show was about what's going on. And what was actually, what came out of it was that smartphones and social media, and I've added, and that's me putting it in, are contributing to the mental health struggle of young people. Because bullying is a big thing. There are some children, that, uh, teenagers that kill themselves. One girl just really killed herself because she was bullied in high school. She couldn't take it. She tried to work with her two friends. They, and they were friends. These were her friends in school. And she ended up committing uh, suicide. So there is a huge, and also, this is um, the journal, the magazine that the institution that I'm associated with, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, just came out, just came out. Part of the press, spring, spring edition, and the title is Healing Child and Teen Mental Health. So this is a major issue, and not only here, but also worldwide. The teens are going through a horrendous time. They don't know how to cope with it, and they don't, they are faced with situations that they don't know how to handle. So uh, as I said, the two mental illnesses that are uh, show up in uh, during teenage years is uh, psychosis, schizophrenia, and depression. So depression affects 8 to 21% by age 18, and the prevalence of schizophrenia and psychosis that includes hallucination, delusion, et cetera, is 5 to 6%. And both associated with poor education outcomes and poor education leads to poor under, not good employment or unemployment or loss of employment, lower personal income, depending on the social or the welfare system, because you can get money if you are, uh, we have system here that, uh, people, that the government will support you, then you have to be on, uh, dependent on them. Or if it gets too bad, then they will come in and take you right away as an individual and you become a ward of the state. And then you have impaired uh, social functioning, delinquent behavior, and then get into all kind of risky activities like smoking, alcohol, drug abuse. And also, as I mentioned before, 
that suicide is a leading cause of teen death. And I've shown you a very graphic picture here. And this is the death rate among teenagers, 1999 to 2006. And majority of it is from depression, from drug abuse, from uh, unintentional suicide, from uh, homicide. Now that they're starting guns, killing students and friends. And then also in accident, car accident, being under influence of alcohol or drugs, end up in car lethal that are fatal. And here is some pictures showing you the uh, depression in teens, some signs and symptoms that parents already know, but I'm just going to go over it very quickly. So we have people that feel dejected. They feel worthless. There's not, it's hopeless. There's nothing to live for. They can think of, uh, just hold on, let me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So they have lost interest in what they were doing. They enjoyed reading a book or meeting friends, rather don't. They've closeted themselves. They don't want, you know, they'll have the rooms bolted. They want people coming in and talking to them. They cry. Literally, they will see them cry for a long time. And then they will either sleep too little or sleep too much. And the other class is either eat too little or eat too much. So it's all of these in teens, I mean, these are focused only on teens. I'm not talking about adult depression. This is specifically symptoms that are, can be seen in teens that we generally might miss them. As parents, we need to be very observant and see if, if most of us don't, they think, oh, crying, so you must be a friend of a hurt or something happened and just not give it in enough importance that it deserves. We should be more vigilant. So how to cope with depression in teens? Talk to your teens. Tell them that you, 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 you understand there's something going on. Tell me. Sometimes, you know, don't be too full, but have the lines of communication open. So they will come to you. And when they come, listen to them. So listening is very important. Let them know that you care. Then you can also teach them uh, stress uh, management techniques. You can introduce them to yoga. I mean, now if you have them online, you don't have to go anywhere. You can literally be at home, turn the TV on, and play a yoga center. And then let the children or the teenagers follow it. Then get them to exercise. Get them out of the rather than sitting in front and looking at the YouTube clips, etc. Let them go play through games. Let them play. Let them play volleyball. Let them play kabaddi. Let them play. Bully danda, like we used to play when we were growing up. You don't need a lot of expensive equipment. Simple, but let them play. That teaches them how to socialize with their peers. It gives them physical exercise. There's a lot of benefit to that. Eating a healthy diet, getting some sleep. I will harp on that again and again. Getting good sleep is very important. And also limiting how much social media interactions are done. And when you know that this is hasn't really resolved the issue, then talk to the family physician. Let them know that there's something going on. You don't have to take it, but let them bring them into the picture, that this is happening and you're concerned about it. And then either the pediatrician or family physician or you yourself can take the child to a therapist and give some therapy session. And if those don't help, then you have to take them to a psychiatrist who will then prescribe medications and the medication, <laughs> the reason I put it last is because remember the brain is developing and you don't want to expose the developing brain to all these very strong medications. But when it's necessary, you have to give it to them. What are the signs of schizophrenia? The, there are early signs and then there are later signs. The later signs are more like what you see in an adult. You can see uh, delusions when you false believe that the KGB or the CIA are behind but after you to get you. You could be hallucinating that God's talking to them, go kill somebody. You can be disorganized. You know, your, your words are very disorganized, like we call a word salad. Make no sense. 
If you talk to some of these people, they start up with something, they'll go to something else, they'll end up somewhere else, and you're completely lost where what was being said and why we had the conversation. So you know there's a issue here. And they're extremely disorganized. They can be very childish at times, or they can be highly agitated at the other end. And uh, negative symptoms, and uh, we see that, uh, I'm not, I'm sure you see that in, 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 in India and Delhi also, but here the biggest problem is you can see them homeless, you know, sleeping on the platforms or uh, the sidewalk, um, unkempt, unhygienic. Um, so, you know, they have issues with negative symptoms. And these are the adult signs, but what do we look for signs in younger people? They may not have these traditional uh, symptoms. They will show signs of withdrawal. Remember, this was also a different. So, yes, to tease apart the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, younger people versus depression, etc. So, maybe you need this is where I don't give you much of uh, insight into what you can do if a child has psychosis, but to take the child to a psychiatrist. Because a psychiatrist needs to examine them and treat them accordingly. They have trouble sleeping. Again, like depression, these uh, people with psychosis have problems sleeping. They have lack of motivation. So you first, you can see there'll be a drop in school performance, cutting classes, uh, showing bizarre behavior. They will not like to bathe or you know, put on uh, proper clothes. They show such sort of violent, aggressive behavior, and they do start taking them. In fact, uh, the, there was a doctor who was who had the office was right next to mine, and his focus was on marijuana effects on teenagers. And uh, he he was telling me, and I don't know if he's been published that or not. Maybe he has. Um, that he found that teenagers that were taking marijuana, they were getting psychotic episodes that looked like schizophrenia. So whether it was a causation factor or was an associative factor, I don't know. I'm not an expert, but but he did find correlation that some children or teenagers that are taking marijuana were showing psychotic of schizophrenia. So let's talk to some of the things, the risky behaviors that teenagers do, alcohol use, uh, the middle, uh, the broken bar you see in teenagers, they, all that has been going down because uh, uh, there's a lot of liquid up there, the parents have been putting it, schools have been telling them to limit the amount of alcohol use, etc. But it, it has gone down, but it has not gone down sufficiently that we can say, okay, problem is over, problem is not over. And especially, especially in college students, especially college students that stay away from home in dorms. And there are some colleges here in the United States that are called party colleges. They go there to these Greek communities, they join them just to have access alcohol, because technically you're not supposed to have alcohol below age 21. But they party, they go have binge drinking. My research is going to look at the effect of all the binge drinking, alcohol, brain development, memory, etc. But I'm not going to go into that today. But what I wonder, in the bottom part, you see a graph there, and the left bottom bar, when you start drinking is very important. If you start to drink when you're less than 12 years of age, they did a harm score, which is the y-axis, is a harm score is 16. That means very high harm score. That means the harm score gives an indication whether that individual will start drinking or taking drugs or doing risky behavior down the line. And if you wait, the last bar on your right, the tiny bar on the right, that is if you start waiting to drink till you're 21 years of age. You see it drops down to a harm score, harm score only 2.6. So the huge reduction, so the longer you can wait before taking your first part of alcohol or drink of alcohol, the better for you because you're not going to become an alcoholic and the chance of you becoming a drug addict, a hardcore drug addict, goes down significantly. And I'm not going to go through this a whole laundry list. I mean, you can only go to Google, Google you go to the site, the Center for Disease Control. Like I said, the wrong last time, Center for Disease Control Prevention. There's a whole laundry list. You get into school problems, legal problems. The police can pull you over and give you a ticket for driving under the school, alcohol, et etc. Et My interest is always being to understand community problems. So that's why I have got it. I'm not talking about that today.
And you think India is immune to any of this? No. So you see, I have uh, clips from different newspapers. There's one from, say, Mohali. Drunk 18-year-old was behind the wheel of killer Mercedes. Western Express Highway crash. Teen drunk had no license. Drunk teen crashes car. So you see, you get a picture. So it's catching up. Because now people are more affluent and they have more money and they want to feed their children because they feel if they give expensive gifts that they can contract for not being very good parents like their parents were. So what they do is they indulge in, in giving their children access to all these gifts, these expensive automobiles, and uh, uh, without enough mental, uh, control or concern, you're going to end up. The other thing is the sickness has gone down significantly, at least in the United States, because there's a lot of restrictions you cannot uh, smoke within the confines of an institution. You cannot smoke within 100 feet of an institution. You cannot smoke in public parks. So you only can smoke in certain deserts. There's a lot of disincentive to smoke. Also, the niche cigarette pack is so high, the teenager, teenagers cannot open up. So it has gone down steadily. If you see this, the topmost left hand line is going down. But look at the broken black line. That is e-cigarettes, electronic cigarettes. That has gone up significantly. Then they sold on the name of Juul, J-U-U-L. And they put in all kinds of flavors, vanilla to attract young people. Now they're banning those flavors because e-cigarette has been so common and so addictive and so powerful, it's driving e-smoking tremendously. So the federal government is trying to take steps for this. Uh, I've listed some healthy, I, I have, Use up 45 minutes of my talk. So what I'm going to see these two slides, which is kind of intuitive. You can all, all come up with this unhealthy maybe. But I want to come to this one or two slides I want to show you. So adolescence is when at your crossroads of one's life. There's a fork in the road. Either you can go to the left or you can go to the right. There's nothing in between. The left is where you, you go the right way and the right is the if you go the wrong way, you end up in addiction, you end up in unemployment, poor job prospects, et cetera, all that, because you are into all kinds of bad things. And on the left, you see, I put Swami Vivekananda, who was a monk. He was only in his teens when he decided to become a monk. And he spent the rest of his life, which was very short, he died at the age of 39, and he revolutionized the world. He inspired Mahatma Gandhi, he inspired many, many people, when he came to, the, to give the uh, lecture the Parliament of Religions in Chicago over 100 years ago, he started with saying, dear brothers and sisters, and he got a stand ovation for seven minutes. Because everybody told them, the people, as sinners, you are sinners, you put us, I will give you and teach you how to go to heaven. He started by saying, you're all divine, and you just have to reach your divinity. So next come Mahatma Gandhi, who was, a, he was very impressed by Swami. He was a successful lawyer. He had a very brilliant practice, but he gave it up. He became brahmacharya, and we know the history. I don't have to repeat that to this audience, because that he, he inspired people like Martin Luther King, from the Nelson Mandela, name it. I mean, he was not only inspiring to his own country, but people around the world were good. At the bottom, I had a picture that nobody, none of people recognize. I even here when I will ask this to anybody here, even 99% would not recognize. Let me tell you who he is. He's Warren Buffett. He's the third richest man in the world. His net worth is $117 billion. That's more than the GDP of many, many countries, many countries. And he's actually you know, the number one is Elon Musk and then Bill Gates. And then Jeff Bezos was there, but he pushed him now. He's now Warren Buffett has become the third. He is a wizard at investing. He has a company and he has a knack of selecting stocks and investing. And his company has been growing. All of the companies were losing money last year on Wall Street. This was the only company that was going to do. That's how he replaced Jeff Bezos and became third in line. Let me tell me a little bit about him. He lives in this old house. For 60 years, since 1958, he eats breakfast on the cheap. He goes to, like, equivalent to your nearest dhaba to buy a cup of tea and to samosas. 
and his maximum bill is three dollars seventeen cents. And if on that day his uh, company did Wall Street, so two samosas became one samosa, and his budget went down to two dollars fifty cents. He does not splurge in name brand. He does not uh, buy. He had a flip phone till twenty years. Very recently, I think his billionaire friend only told him that he should get a smartphone. He buys used cars. No Jaguars, no Bentleys, no Mercedes in his in his garage. He buys used cars that were on sale. He he and you know he doesn't want to buy things because he just wants to go off and just be good. His when his first child was born, he took one of his wife's second drawer drawers and made it into a basket for the child. Billionaire man buy the whole the baby's store, uses a dressing a drawer. Put some uh, blankets and all, make it in the basket. Then he does not use credit cards; he uses cash. He cut coupons. You know, like we have buy one get one free, buy this you get fifty percent off. He cuts them, saves them. When he took Bill Gates for a lunch or one of the meals in Hong Kong, he took him not to an expensive restaurant but to a McDonald's, and he used coupons to pay for it. So he got probably got one. Uh, A hamburger, you get a one hamburger free with some soda thrown in. That's probably what he got. So, but why am I, why am I talking about them and his frugality or being cheap or consumes? Why am I talking about him? Because he lives spiritually. Not he's a monk and he's counting his beads or he's you know he is living the life of a spiritual man. Ninety nine percent of his wealth will be given away. He's not saving it. He's not spending the money to give it to his children and grandchildren, and so that they don't have to work. Ninety-nine percent will be given up while he's still alive, and the rest when he dies. Not only that, not only he's giving his money away, he's also gotten a group together called Giving Pledge, and he's gotten all his billionaire friends. And you have listed you see the name, some of the names you will recognize, like Jim Cramer and all that stuff, to part with their billion dollars. So they can have a kitty fund to help people in the world, and we've all heard Bill Gates and the foundations in it and all the stuff. He's he's behind that force. So his advice to young people is: love something, then you'll do well at it. Don't do it. Don't don't get into a position because it looks good on your CV or resume, but it should be something that you want to do, that you enjoy doing it. And so my advice to the parents is. And I'm going to go rush because I've already run out of time. I'm sorry. I didn't think I was going to take this much time. So accept the children that they're not children anymore. The grown up, avoid lecturing to them, listen to them, respect them, allow them the privacy that they deserve. But let them fail. Because when you learn, that's how you get stronger and wiser, creative. And so don't protect them. Don't be the protecting them all the time. Learn them to teach them to learn to make. Uh, and then uh, you know, and also teach by example. You're telling put on the seat belt when you when they get to the car, and yet you don't put on the seat belt. What kind of example are you setting? So teach by example and enjoy your teens because they'll be gone very soon, and then you'll miss them. So by that's for the parents and for the uh, the teens. Take care of the body. Play good games. Play do yoga. You know whatever. Take care of your mind. Read good books. Order a biography. Limit interactions on the social media. Don't make these clips and put them on video and uh, on, on YouTube or whatever. So that friends and you become popular. You know you're driving, sits there, you know, sitting on top of a car and the car is going 100 miles per hour. That one second will cost your life. So don't do this kind of things. Don't care what others think of you. Don't compare to others. So these are things. Learn to say no. Uh, then do some charity works. Think about others. Do service to people. Go. I mean, lecture from two a few days ago about about you know going to a neighbor, elderly neighbor who lives by himself. You know, go there. Them. Run a few errands for them. They will enjoy the company. You will learn a lot from them. So this is something you don't do. Invest a lot of time and energy going elsewhere. Confide in someone. Don't keep things to yourself. And to finally, remember, true wealth is not in accumulating money. I gave you the example of Warren Buffett. He doesn't collect. He doesn't give away. So, but building good character is very important. And have fun. Be healthy. 
stay healthy. So my journey is more important than the destination. Life is a series of small moments, learning how to focus on them and enjoy the process. And as I said, acquiring material goods does not buy happiness, be good and do. And I have to, I, I, as a devotee of the Ramakrishna order, I want to offer my prayers and my pranam to Thakur Swamiji. And with that, I'm going to again. And I'm sorry, I apologize for taking more. I had cut down slides, but I still went over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Makna, ma'am. Thanks a lot for sharing all your valuable knowledge and experience with all of us. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. We can uh, open the Q&A session. Participants, if any one of you have a question, please unmute yourself, or you can raise the hand, or you can put the question in the chat box. Uh, very good evening. Yes, please Hello. Please. Hello. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, ma'am, my son is an adolescent, and now mm -hmm. I'm seeing new behavior in him. Earlier, he used to keep his nails clean. Now, he doesn't want to clean even after 15 days. Right? For everything which I tell him, he has an answer by which he will cancel that command, right? So new behaviors and uh, sometimes they try to prove me wrong. But they you're so right. Yeah. You have hit it now. That they are trying to show their independence. They are not tied to apron strings. This is the thing that we are evolving. You may not like it. You might find it difficult to accept that this baby that I was telling where he would do everything I told him to do, now all of a sudden he has answers for everything. That is because, and that's very healthy. Don't curb it. Don't curb it. Let him be an individual. You don't want him to be too tied to you all the time. You want to give him the freedom to participate while he's still with you. Because soon he'll be to college or he'll be gone to his job somewhere else. You will not be there. But he knew or knows that you have, he has your support. And you gave him the right, uh, uh, you know, conditions and the values. He will. You would have done your job. You would be a blessed parent. But you have learned that they are not children anymore. They are becoming adults. So they're going through that phase, and it's hard for a parent. It's harder for the child also. Wants to be independent, and yet at times wants advice from the parent. What should I do? How should I go? But they don't want to go because they will be seen as filthy. But still, don't do that. So they're in that struggle, in the struggle for them. You have to respect them. That's all. Just be patient with them. You have to be patient. So, <laughs> so, what should I tell regarding the cleanliness? Other, other. Uh, earlier, he used to keep his nails clean. His Elmira was very systematic. Now it is not there. So you can do two things. You can put a time time limit. Say, you know what. I give you, I know you're very busy, you have an exam coming up or you have this, something, something, whatever is coming up in your life. I'm going to give you time. Give him a sufficient time. Give him a week, two weeks or a month maybe. But then he say, if you don't do that, I will go and clean it for you. I will clean it. Either he will not like it or he will say, no, don't worry, don't worry, I'll do it. But you are is indifferent. So there's no way of, of, of uh, predicting which way he'll go. You can put deadlines, flexible, be flexible with them, and then tell him that, you know, your deadline is coming up. You said you're going to clean by May 15th or something. It's already May 1st. So I just want to remind you, do that a few times. And then and then stick with it. If you said you're going to go in and clean the room on May 13th, go in and clean the room on May 13th. But to show that what you say is what you mean. Then he will next week will be, oh, if I don't do it, mother is going to do it. Does that make sense? He feels happy if I clean it. Then you can tell him. You can tell him. I'm doing it, but tomorrow you're going to go to college. And you do this in your dorm, you share it with another friend. He or she maybe will not like it. Then you will be in trouble. I want to do it. I don't mind doing it. 
but you will be the one who will have trouble. When you are you got your first job in a town or a city far away, mother is not going to come and do a cleaning. You have to do you have to learn now. I'm here to teach you. I'll do it for you now, but don't don't get in the habit that I'm going to do it forever. Then let it be dirty forever. Then just let it stay dirty. Let his friends come and bring his friends and let them see how dirty his room is. Maybe that will help. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That was an Thank interesting you. question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, ma'am. If anyone else has a question, please go ahead. I guess not. Dr. Bizlani, would you like to share any views? Thank you, Ratna, for a very comprehensive uh, talk. There was hardly any aspect of adolescence that you did not touch, ranging from uh, biology to psychology, normal psychology, and the abnormalities, uh, which are pretty common in young age. Uh, just about every aspect that one can imagine, uh, you touched. And uh, just a few comments that uh, I thought, uh, since I have the opportunity, I would like to... Uh, make her that uh, what appeals to a young person is uh, something which is uh, more rational and experiential rather than something which uh, is in terms of sermonizing or uh, pressurizing or trying to break the child's will. Uh, especially when I was thinking of the last question that uh, Lena asked. Uh, uh, these are things which uh, an adolescent does not uh, perhaps appreciate. Of course, uh, different adolescents are different. Uh, but uh, uh, in general, uh, what they prefer is something which comes from their own experience or from reason rather than something which comes as uh, uh, an order or sermon or uh, uh, something which uh, the uh, parent or the teacher is trying to say. Uh, and uh, some of the things that uh, along those lines one can perhaps do are that try to set up for the child an experiential exercise. And that is, uh, say, if the child is not uh, uh, looking after personal hygiene, uh, some of the, whatever aspect of hygiene, or <laughs> food or whatever, or sleep, tell them, okay, you uh, can just do an experiment. Uh, do it like this for uh, one day or one week, and don't do this for the next week and see which one feels better. Uh, another thing which uh, probably can uh, appeal at that stage is uh, uh, to set uh, the right example. That is, the parent herself is uh, doing it with a, and let the child observe rather than sermonize. Uh, and uh, then uh, offer the child alternative joys. Uh, the child is doing something because the child is enjoying it. Try and see is there something else also which uh, the child enjoys occasionally maybe, but is not finding the time for it these days. Because uh, uh, adolescents, uh, as uh, you know, the title itself said, that's the best of times and the worst of times. So on the better side, the uh, children at that age have a lot of courage and idealism. They have big dreams. Uh, they are uh, keen to change the world. They are very unrealistic, but that the lack of realism is uh, in a way very healthy. And uh, they are non-conformists. They are not bound down by conventions. They want to. Uh, they don't go by this. That this is how it has been done for thousands of years or hundreds of years, and therefore that must be the right way to do. If it has worked for hundreds of years, it will also work today. That is type, not the type of argument that works with them. They are non-conformists. And in fact, all progress depends upon non-conformism. Because if uh, uh, we were going to do everything that has been done for hundreds of years, then there'll be no change. And progress itself implies change. Progress itself means that today we are better than what we were yesterday and tomorrow we'll be better than what we are today. Now, being better 
is a change from where we are to something better than that. Now that is a change. And change is something which depends upon this type of non-conformism, conformism, which is based on rationality, based on uh, idealism, based on dreams, based on being unrealistic, and based on a lot of courage. Now, these are all things which young people have. Exploit these. And see, which are the areas in which the child has those dreams which look beyond the child's own little self. So the basic idea is to take the child away from obsession with his own little self so let him try and let try and find out which are those dreams in which the child is occasionally giving hints of uh, having some aspiration to look beyond himself. Someone may be interested, say, if he's very good at academics, teaching younger children. Someone may be interested in offering food to poor people. It's, you know, so the interest could differ. But try to find out which is that passion which this child has, and then create an opportunity for the child to have that type of an indulgence in that passion where the child is looking beyond him. So if the child is very interested in feeding poor people. So you cook some food at home and tell them today we'll go on a ride and at traffic lights or outside temples, there are many poor people, we'll distribute the food to them. Uh, or let the child learn that I can do this uh, voluntarily by undergoing a hardship. Suppose the child has decided to go to a restaurant. You tell the child in the restaurant, how much will you spend on food? Say 500 rupees per head. So I'll spend 500 rupees on my meal. Now, instead, you go to, well, Ratna said, to a place like a dhaba, the way Warren Buffet also does. So go to a place like that, spend only 50 rupees. Now you're not doing that to say 450 rupees. With those 450 rupees, you can feed nine hungry people. So buy food for nine more people and feed them those who really need the food. Now, let him eat the meal for 500 rupees one day and let him have a 50 rupee meal plus a 50 rupee meal for nine more people another day. Ask him, you were perhaps happy when you had the 500 rupee meal? Yes. You were happy when you did this? Yes. Now, which of the two types of happiness feels better? Now, you align yourself to the child's passion. This child is not interested in uh, teaching ch children who are not able to afford school. This child is more interested in feeding. So you have aligned yourself with the child's passion. That passion in which the child occasionally drops hints at looking beyond himself. And then you're asking the child, this is an experiment we are doing. Uh, this gives you happiness. That gives you happiness. Which of the two felt better? Now, this is how you can exploit the positive features of uh, the childhood. And it is exactly because of these positive features that some of the negative features are there. It is because the child is a non-conformist and a rationalist and we are trying to tell him that you just do what uh, the accumulated wisdom of the world is trying to tell us is the right thing to do. He's not in, interested in detoing that accumulated wisdom. He wants to discover things for himself, reason things for himself. And sometimes he can also be lazy because of competing interests. Now, what are those competing interests? Again, you can exploit the child's interests. The child is, as the child is growing, as Ratna was pointing out, is going physical as well as psychological changes during puberty. Sexuality is a major distraction for the child. And that could be one of the reasons why the child is lazy about many things. Exploit that. Uh, if it's a boy, tell him that uh, uh, girls will not like this. If you neglect yourself, if you are not, don't take care of personal hygiene, girls are not going to like you. Now, you're exploiting, again, so understand the child, Align yourself with the child and the child is likely to listen more. So these are some of the thoughts that crossed my mind uh, while uh, this session was going on. And uh, what about spirituality? Because our uh, focus always remains on spirituality. Ratna did bring in a bit of it. Now for a child or an adolescent, spirituality firstly should not mean organized religion. Uh, all uh, thinking uh, adolescents who think for themselves in general do not like that. No rituals, no ceremonies, no organized religion. But as I said, they have a lot of idealism. Sometimes they want to change the world. Now, take some leaves from that. See what is the passion of the child. Engage the child in that. Even for example, when I was talking about feeding nine hungry people, or say if the child has a passion for teaching, collecting 10 uh, children from a slum, or the children of the people who work in your homes as a household help, collect their children, 
uh, spend a few hours every week teaching those children. Now, these are the types of things that is spirituality for the uh, youngster. And that is, in fact, spirituality for every one of us. Because ultimately, what is spiritual life about? Bringing spirituality into ordinary worldly life essentially means giving what we have to those who need it. So you have to find that complementary situation. What is it that this young person, this adolescent can give? And who are the people who need it? What is the type of giving that this child enjoys the most? Create that situation where the child's passion can be aligned with giving something to those who need it. That is spirituality for the child. Don't have to call it by any name. Don't call it spirituality. That itself might put the child off. But the child is learning to do things which uh, make sense to the child at that age. Uh, no matter how well intellectually developed he is, still these things do make sense because somewhere deep within, as Atna said in the beginning, that we are not just the body and the mind. We have a deeper self. We are a soul. And uh, that has its needs and it is because of that soul that we have these aspirations, the adolescent included. But why the adolescent does not manifest it at that stage? Because along with all the positive features like uh, courage and idealism and an aspiration to change the world, which are reflecting that deeper aspiration, the corresponding negatives are also there. The child is in a great hurry. The child is rash. There is sexuality. There is peer pressure. Now all those things are there and therefore, and on top of that, the brain is not fully developed. The brain is still developing as we were told. So all this creates a big mess in the child's head. And therefore, what the child needs is understanding. Firstly, understand what type of a chaotic situation the child is in at that age, which is natural. And we all have to go through that stage. We, if we look back, we also went through that stage of turbulence. And at that stage, an understanding adult, sometimes the parent, sometimes the child, a teacher, and sometimes a total stranger like a counselor. Depends on the situation because sometimes, you know, as they say, apno ki baat nahi koi sunta, bahar walo ke sun leta hai. So, bahar ka koi mil jai, usko, uh, usse karwa di jai advice. So, no matter how, but the child, the, while the child shows great deal of confidence that I know everything and all these grown-ups uh, know nothing, so this is a part of that courage and, you know, rashness. Because the child is very idealistic and he finds that all around him I find that people are not doing what I think they should be doing. So uh, if only I could uh, I could be given, handed over the charge of running the world, I'll run it so much better. The parents are not doing a good job. The teachers are not doing a good job at school. The parents are not doing a good job of parenting. And the government is not doing a good job of running the country. Hand over all these things to me and I'll show them how to do it. Now, that is being rash. But at the same time, the child is idealistic. And we get to exploit that and understand that why the child is behaving like that and belittling everybody else, contradicting everybody else. This is something not new. This has been always the, so, as uh, you know, again, Ratna said in the beginning, even Socrates said the same thing uh, more than uh, 2000 years ago. So uh, this is something which every generation has faced. Today, we are facing it more than before because the world is changing much faster. We ourselves can imagine that even 50 years ago, when we hardly had uh, email, perhaps even email didn't exist. Today, we have gone so much beyond email. This type of sessions were unimaginable 50 years ago. Even email was something which knew we were depending upon things like fax and so on about 50 years ago. Now fax is uh, unthinkable. You can do much better than fax, much cheaper and much faster. So world is changing very fast, the communication and everything. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, the generation gap is much wider than it was in the days of Socrates. Secondly, there's an evolutionary thrust. You know, as Shurabindu and the mother have said that uh, the, uh, we are at a critical point in the evolution of consciousness. So because of that evolutionary thrust, there's a much larger number of younger people being born who are showing a greater tendency towards this type of idealism, this type of an aspiration to change the world. Of course, they'll do it in the way that is characteristic of an adolescent. But all the same, the number of such children is increasing. So both the pace at which the world is changing because of technology and this evolutionary thrust because of which children who are more, so to say, idealistic in nature, the number of such children is going up. The number of children who are questioning the conventions is going up. You know, as Shirobindo calls them, the barrier breakers of the world. You'll see more and more. So because of this, that we are facing this. So what we have to see is show that understanding that what we are doing is not because we want to break the will of the child, 
it's not because we want the child to be unhappy. It's because we want the child to experience a better version of happiness. So for that, set up uh, situations in which the child will experience that better version of happiness. Sometimes make the child compare two versions of happiness based on an experiment, experiment and the experience that the child gets from that experiment. Now, these are the types of things which are likely to work much better than a more conventional approach in which you are just trying to sort of use your age and authority to break the will of the child. Now, these are some of the things which occurred to me as this session was going on. And uh, I hope uh, it may address the question that Lena put. And also, these, and this is a general question which might have be of some interest to all the other uh, viewers as well. Uh, Thank you. Uh, sir, continuing with this question, I have one more question. May I ask? Sure. Although we are only 10 minutes past 7, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's okay. see. So whether it is distributing uh, any uh, food or it is teaching, my son likes uh, to, be, uh, to be watching uh, YouTube, use, watching Minecraft, and he spent lot many hours on these things rather than doing some work for the society. Okay. And uh, now, again, that's a common problem. I mean, something which uh, occurred to me, if that is the passion of the child and aligning the passion of the child, uh, tell the child that, why do you want to go on watching what others have created? Why don't you create something yourself? Let the child create videos and uh, then give the child the option of a video which uh, will give something that uniquely you can give to somebody as compared to something which will be uh, relatively sort of cheap, vulgar or frivolous. Let him see which is the type of video that gives him greater pleasure, even if the number of views that the better video gets is much fewer. So go by the joy that you get rather than the number of views that you get. We are not seeking validation from numbers. We are seeking validation in terms of the quality of the joy that you experience. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Ratna, ma'am, we have a question uh, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Marcelo says, uh, every human being searches for freedom consciously or unconsciously. And the role of parents, teachers, seem very important in helping the adolescent in that process. However, times and circumstances change for every generation. Which are, in your vision, the main challenges to adolescents today? How would you suggest to help them about that? That's a very, very good question. Very relevant for this day and age. As Dr. Bijlani has mentioned, the technology has skyrocketed. What we couldn't think even 10 years ago, we are able to do. As, as, as Dr. Bijlani just said, having this Zoom conference halfway around the world with pictures, with instantaneous talking interactions going on, this is mind boggling, right? We, cannot, we can rewind and go back to the day we used to go to Blockbusters to get a video of a movie, we can do instantaneous watching. So the question is, that in every generation, they wanted freedom, more so now than before, because they see us out there. They have the videos, they have uh, social contacts, their friends and the friends and the friends and the media is feeding in. But the bottom line is the freedom. They want, as I said, they want to cut the apron strings for their parents and then move away in their direction, whatever the direction may be. You may as a parent or may not like it. But as long as it's a healthy one, you should be happy. And I'm always talking about the kite. You know, kite? As a kite, what do you do? You, you, before it can release go away, you hold it. Then you leave it a little bit. It goes up a little bit. Then you pull it down. So you have to give freedom in measure. Because you have to make sure that the freedom is being used in a healthy way. There are safe boundaries. Yes, you can say your child, okay, you can go out at night. In my time, we had to all be home by sundown, right? That cannot apply today. So you say, okay, you go out at night, 
but come back by put some put some the release of time from p and when you come back make sure you're not driving a car or you're not driven by somebody who should not be driving so put in limitations so you hold the thread then the child uh, the adolescent learns that there are loops and bounds and it will take and it understands the right choices from the wrong choices there will be as i'm not a 100% cool proof but there will be times but overall you see the kite also goes up and down up and down, finally it just takes off that's what we want with the child holding them back and giving them the opportunities giving them the freedom giving them the support that they need to go higher and higher and reach their full potential that's how i thank you so much thank you We do not have any more questions as such. So, thank you again, Ratna ma'am, for giving your precious time to us and the valuable knowledge. I thank the participants as well for being there with us today. Actually, I see a question here. Well, hold on. There's a question from Preeti Bhardwaj, and she says, "Start with activities which they give and share." when they are young and not just uh, constant studies and comp that exactly what i said don't dictate what they should do and that they should go become a lawyer or a judge or go to iit don't put those restrictions on leave it up to the individual to do find their way make let them make mistakes and organize what is what i mean i say i'm not saying that everybody has to go to iit or everybody has to become a uh, the whatever virat kohli or something you have to have your own vision have your own attitude and follow your dreams within boundaries and so you know but i'm not proposing that everybody become a sports star or anything and this is where the parents come in actually they're feeding of what the parents are doing parents always say oh you if you play cricket you should become uh, the next uh, superstar don't do that let them enjoy the game for safe with it if they have the uh, the, 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 the capability of becoming a superstar they do. but don't make that right in the beginning that this is what you should aspire to let them have fun i keep saying hey, let them have fun let them discover themselves let them make mistakes okay they said sorry to cricket cricket didn't work out maybe he's just better at swimmer let him swim and say okay he's got good swimming skills let me put him in a in a program and let him take it from there i am not advocating structured uh, that everybody has to go to iit and everybody has to go to becoming a cricket player it will all depend as as dr islani said what the child is uh, make up the child is we all come with our karmas prarabdha karma we've already done our karmas so something being born in your family was also karma that the child wasn't born in in a homeless family or wasn't born in an abusive family so there are karmas that are there there's so much freedom we can have a whole discussion of spirituality in the world itself but what i'm saying is you have to give them the opportunity to discover who they are and what they're comfortable and they want to and you are there to help them as much as possible that's all you can do you can only provide guidelines you cannot determine the path for them they have to follow the path they have to fall they have to get up they have to find a different fork in the road to define the main road for them that's what i can say okay thank you for the nice question thank you ma'am thank you everyone for being with us today we can close today's session with a moment of peaceful silence namaste namaste <laughs>